The kimono. A garment that embodies Japanese tradition. Many foreigners delight in the kimono as an icon of Japanese culture. It took centuries to reach the form familiar to us today. Down through the ages, the kimono has reflected both the aesthetics and the thrifty practical ingenuity of the Japanese. This time on Japanology Plus, our theme is the kimono, a wearable canvas for traditional Japanese art, craft and design. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Barakan. I'm sure most people's stereotypical image of Japan includes kimono, but when you visit here you'll find out pretty quickly that actually very, very few people wear them these days. I myself have a lifelong aversion to formal wear, so when the situation dictates that something like that is in order, I'll get by by wearing a kimono instead. I can tell you it's stepping into a whole different world. One of Kyoto's three major festivals, the Jidai Matsuri, showcases 1,000 years of evolving clothing styles. This was formal dress for court ladies about 1,000 years ago, a multi-layered garment called a Juni Hitoe. What we now know as a kimono derives from the undergarment of the Juni Hitoe. The modern kimono dates back only about 300 years. It is a one-piece garment. It doesn't have a separate top and bottom. Long sleeves are another hallmark. An unmarried woman's formal kimono is called a furisode. The more formal the garment, the longer its sleeves. They may even be a meter long. The black kimono on the left is a highly formal garment for a married woman. The upper part features the family crest, while the decoration around the legs is very elaborate. In the mid-20th century, Western clothing was adopted as the everyday norm. The kimono became a garment used only for life's milestone events. Those events include shrine visits to pray for children at certain ages. For girls, a visit is made at ages 3 and 7, and for boys at age 5. Many children wear kimono on these occasions. It is common to see women wearing kimono at graduation ceremonies. Kimono combined with hakama, wide pleated trousers, for centuries, the hakama had been worn mainly by men. But women embraced them again in the late 19th century. A hakama offered much more freedom of movement than a kimono, and it became a symbol of women's emerging opportunities to study and to work. A stylish kimono with dashing hakama has since become a graduation tradition. Many couples still get married in traditional Japanese dress. For the groom, a kimono-hakama combination with family crest. For the bride, an all-white wedding kimono. In recent years, more people have embraced the kimono as a chic fashion option. Kimono are traditionally made from silk, linen or cotton but synthetic fibers have made them far more affordable. In today's Japan, the venerable kimono is enjoying renewed interest. Well, as you can see, a magical transformation has now taken place, and I've got the full set. This kimono here, in addition to my kimono, I have this, which in Japanese is called a haori and it functions like a jacket in the West. And these, I mean, this looks like a skirt, I know. It's actually a very wide pair of trousers, and they're pleated as well. In Japanese, they're called hakama.
And this whole set has been put together for me by a kimono stylist called Setsuko Ishida. Ishida-san, thank you very much for being with us today. And thank you very much for putting together this very cool suit, as it were. <laughs> now, perhaps you can start off by telling us what sort of occasion I would be dressed for looking like this. The combination of kimono with family crest and hakama is the most formal style. But the material you're wearing is silk ponji, so the effect is more like a jacket and trousers in the West. Not formal enough for a wedding, but okay for most other occasions. Mm. And because we're in summer now, uh, the whole thing, these are all made of light material, aren't they? Yes, a summer kimono has no lining and a breathable weave. You can see the material is a little bit see-through, good for ventilation. It looks cool too. And the colours too are very typically Japanese restrained colours, aren't they? In between shades are really lovely, like a mix of blue and grey, or purple and green, and so on. The colour of the kimono I chose for you today is called Fujinezu. This beautifully mixes the mauve of wisteria flowers with grey. Oh, that's interesting because I think to the average Western eye it would probably look like grey. But when you're told that there's a hint of kind of mauve in it, it's like, ah, yes, that really does make sense. And it's just a subtle difference, isn't it? In Japan, Rather than simply yellow or red, colours were named after things that could be seen around us in everyday life. Oh, oh, oh. Like your own kimono, how would you describe this one? This is the colour of eggplant. I think it's pretty close to that. A shade of purplish blue. Choosing the colour has long been part of the pleasure of wearing kimono. 1,000 years ago, a woman would wear a juni hitoe kimono so that the different colors showed. But over the centuries, patterns became more important. This selection of painted kimono samples dates from the early 18th century. The various kimono here feature gorgeous embroidery and dyeing techniques. As Japan reaped the benefits of years of peace, Business prospered, and people sought out more ornate clothing. Here is a kimono from that time. The fabric is dyed black and festooned with polonia blossoms rendered in colorful gold thread embroidery. At around the same time in history, the main fashion trendsetters for kimono designs were kabuki actors and courtesans. This checkerboard look was popularized by one famous kabuki actor. The same pattern appears on this woman's kimono. The motif was a hit and remains popular to this day. The shogunate, however, preferred austerity and would periodically clamp down on everyday clothing that was too colorful or luxurious. Then, people would think up fashions to get around the regulations. One trick was to incorporate a pattern known as komon. At first glance, there is nothing flashy at all about a kimono like this. But a closer look at each one will reveal various intricate dyed motifs. Here's one typical common design, consisting of countless dyed markings. It is said to resemble shark skin. Each dot is just half a millimeter across, and the dots are arranged in waves of semicircles. This kimono is dyed in a checkerboard common pattern. Inside each square is a chrysanthemum design, long a favorite motif in Japan. Seemingly subdued but exceptionally elegant, common became very popular among city dwellers in the 18th century and many light-hearted designs appeared. 
This motif is a broom which sweeps away misfortune. Here's another lucky image, a folding fan. In fact, a number of objects considered lucky were turned into common designs. Following the end of the shogunate in the mid-19th century, flashy garments made a comeback. Some kimono even featured Western motifs. Every kimono has the same cut. It is pattern and color that reveal a wearer's fashion sense. We talked a moment ago about how the materials used vary uh, with the seasons. I gather that uh, designs too also change from season to season. Many kimono designs feature classic seasonal motifs. Flowers and foliage have strong seasonal associations. In spring, the cherry blossom. In summer, nadeshko. In autumn, maple. And in winter, camellia and plum blossom. Winter motifs also include snow, while summer and autumn garments often feature dragonflies. I've dressed myself for July. Do you notice anything seasonal about my kimono? That's not a particular design. Is it this? What is that? Is that a whale or something? Sea bream, tai. Tai? Yes, it's a fish. Is that what it is? Summer is a time of year when people want to cool off with the help of water, the sea, lakes and rivers. It's when people go swimming at the beach. So that's why we have this leaping sea bream. As it leaps, it splashes. See this crystal ornament? This represents the splash. So a kimono can feature playful touches. Oh. Are there any rules that govern the kind of designs that are worn in a particular season, for example? You want to be just ahead of the season. That's seen as stylish, very chic. Oh. Meanwhile, a look that's late for the season is the very opposite of chic. Why is it good to be ahead of the season? Anticipation. Japan has clear seasonal divisions. How much longer until spring? I wish summer would hurry up and get here. I think people look forward to the season that's approaching. Hi, I'm Matt Alt, and this is Plus One. Now, I don't often wear kimono myself, in fact, almost never, but I do find myself sometimes wearing yukata. There's a trick to wearing them, though, and to that end, I am here with Mr. Koji Okuno, who runs an NPO that's dedicated to popularizing Japanese culture abroad. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. The yukata is a light cotton or linen kimono, dating back at least 300 years. Even today, many young people wear a yukata to events in the summer. Let's see how to put one on. First, stand with your feet together. Okay, my hey. feet. Hold the bottom of the lapel here. Like this. Yes. And this lapel too. Now pull both straight out. I see. Tuck this to your left and this to your right. If you do it correctly, your right hand can slide into the breast like this. Why is it important to fold it over this way? Why is, why is, is, is the opposite bad? That's the arrangement used for a dead body. Next, you secure the yukata with a band at the waist. It will loosen nicely. Now I'll show you how to put the obi on. Okay. A man's obi should rest on the pelvis, right here. Let's see why. Try moving your upper body a bit. Firm support here. That's true. It keeps the yukata looking good. Interesting. An obi is about four meters long. It wraps around twice then is knotted once and a second time. 
Now, just slide it around to the back. Okay. Oh, it, fits, it, it like slides right into place. Yeah. Very nice. Is there a name for this? A kaino kuchi knot. That means it looks like the mouth of a shellfish. Now, Matt's yukata is on properly. Well, I feel like I'm all dressed up now, but I, I don't know how I can go out without any pockets. What should I do? Use this, here. Oh, look. <laughs> You're like a magician. Sort of. What about small change? Pay with a bill, get some change, just drop it into your sleeve. Okay, well, you know, that's money, but what about, say, I don't know, a cell phone? I carry mine here. How much stuff do you have hidden in there? Oh, this and that. Originally, people would only wear a yukata in the local neighborhood. Just stash your essentials and your hands would be free. Very stylish. Well, thank you for showing me how to wear a yukata. My pleasure. Well, there you have it, the basics of wearing a yukata. Next time you come to Japan, give it a try yourself. Until then, we'll be taking a little walk around town. Let's go. See you next time. Let's talk about some of the basic different types of kimono. What do we have? We can categorize them by fabric. You have white fabric that's dyed to make pictures, or threads that are dyed first and then woven to create patterns. That's the other type. This is an example of Kyo Yuzen. Using the so-called Yuzen technique, white fabric is decorated like a painted canvas. Dyes in many colors are applied. The Yuzen technique was invented in Kyoto several hundred years ago. First, the design is sketched on fabric in ink that will wash out when the fabric is rinsed. Then, the outlines are traced with a resist paste using a special tool. Wherever the paste is, the dye will not penetrate the fabric, leaving it white. The paste lines can be a fraction of a millimeter thick. Now the dye is applied. The resist paste lines form boundaries between different areas of color. They prevent the dye from bleeding across. After this, the paste and excess dye will be rinsed off using water. Many processes are required to create a yuzen dyed fabric with the impact of a painting. Some yuzen kimono cost tens of thousands of dollars. A yuzen kimono makes the wearer look very elegant. Elegant contours are a hallmark, and the many different colors of dye give yuzen fabric a special appeal. <laughs> And this is an example of the woven style, isn't it? Yes, this is silk ponji from the north of the Kanto region. It's called Yuki Tsumugi. It's UNESCO intangible cultural heritage and an important folk cultural property of Japan. Making Yuki Tsumugi fabric starts with the spinning of special thread. Silk cocoons are reeled out, then strands are twisted together into a single thread using saliva. Thread to weave a patterned kimono is dyed using a masking technique. Portions of thread that should remain undyed are knotted. Then the thread goes in a dye bath. What comes out is thread with some parts dyed and some undyed. The pattern is created by weaving partially dyed thread according to a scheme worked out in advance. To make the pattern correctly demands exceptionally precise weaving. It takes at least three months to weave enough fabric for a single kimono. Compared with the Yuzen kimono that we saw a moment ago, this one looks quite simple. If one wanted to go out and buy one of these new now, what sort of price would you be looking at? 
One with no pattern would cost the equivalent of about 5,000 US dollars. With a pattern woven into it like this, you'd pay over 10,000. Okay. I think a lot of people watching this program outside Japan are going to be slightly surprised by that. Many regions of Japan produce distinctive kimono fabrics. This is Echigo Jofu fabric. It's for summer kimonos, but the key process is done during the winter. Niigata Prefecture gets heavy snow, and snow plays a key role. The threads are linen and have a yellowish hue. Fabric woven from linen thread is laid over fresh snow on a clear winter day. When water vapor released by melting snow is exposed to ultraviolet rays, ozone is generated. And ozone has a bleaching effect. This causes the fabric to whiten. A summery fabric that owes its brilliant whiteness to Japan's snow country. Amamiyoshima is an island with sweltering summers. Here, too, they have a distinctive kimono. Called Oshima Tsumugi, this kimono fabric has a trademark black. Dye is made using a fermentation process involving local plants. The dye is applied to the fabric. Then, the fabric is immersed in muddy water. The tannins in the dye and the abundant iron content of the mud react to turn the fabric a deep black. A special shade of black born of an island's natural resources. The Nishijin district of Kyoto gives its name to the sumptuous fabrics that are woven there. Generations of Kyoto fashion lovers drove the development of the intricate techniques that make Nishijin Ori Kimono breathtaking works of art. This is Tsuzure Ori brocade. It's used for obi. One essential tool for making this brocade is the artisan's fingernail. The tiny grooves in the nail tug the threads as the work progresses. It is so demanding that as little as one centimeter of fabric may be made each day. The kimono and obi of Japan are genuine craft masterpieces. One thing I've always found interesting is that the, the bolt of cloth from which a kimono is made is called a, a tang. It doesn't matter what size you are, your kimono is always going to be made from the same bolt of cloth. Why is that? A ton is about 13 meters long, and it's about 39 centimeters wide. If you're making a kimono for a tall person, you cut it to maximum length. For a shorter person, the surplus fabric is taken up at the hem, but you don't cut the fabric. How long can an average kimono be worn for? for three generations. Wow. It's an heirloom. A kimono can easily last a century. So obviously they have to be cared for very well as well. Now and then they need to be completely unstitched and washed. Japan has ways to restore kimono fabric using techniques that have been cultivated over the centuries. Here's a kimono rejuvenation expert. This is my mother's old kimono. Okay. Can you restore it? Let me have a look. The customer's mother wore this kimono until just before her death. Now the daughter wants to have it retailored. The first step is to undo all the stitching and sew the fabric back to its original shape. A kimono's unique structure makes this possible. Taking a kimono apart leaves only rectangular pieces of fabric. You can see exactly how the original fabric was pieced together. 
With a Western garment, the fabric is cut to match the shape of the body, and you end up with various different shaped pieces. Once restored, each length of original kimono fabric is washed. A good rinse can bring a silk kimono back to life. Then, bamboo ribs are used to stretch the wet silk taut. It takes about 300 ribs to stretch one bolt. Pasting on starch makes the fabric look brand new. Fabric refreshed and relieved of all its creases can then be retailed to the customer's size. I've had young men bring in kimono. They'll come to me saying, my father never wears this, but I will. They'll bring along a number of kimono. I think that's great to see. Time-honored techniques reflect the great importance attached to kimono. You can always retailer a kimono to a different size or use just a portion of the fabric to make something else entirely, an obi, for example, or haori. Or you can use the fabric itself. One thing you can do with the fabric is use it as a table runner. Or you can frame it like art. In the old days, the fabric was used and reused, and eventually it would even be turned into nappies for a baby. Not a scrap wasted. It's the ultimate in Japanese-style recycling. I remember a few years ago, uh, the word motainai in Japanese became famous worldwide uh, on account of the lady who won the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Wangari Maatai from Kenya. And that whole idea of motainai seems to be really kind of well represented in what you were just saying about how kimono are used. Fascinating, isn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next time, kokeshi, wooden dolls from Northeast Japan. Once playthings and now collector's items, kokeshi are a very much loved craft tradition.